Good evening, good to have you with us as we meet together. Let's trust the Lord will bless us as we worship him. Let's turn to our opening psalm, Psalm 22. It's not going to be all 11, it's just going to be the first five verses. Slight change to what's listed. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. And if we could turn, stand and sing 151, Hail, thou once despised Jesus, hail, thou Galilean King. Let's turn to God in prayer and let us all pray. Lord God, as we approach the period of Easter, it's a reminder of how you, how our beloved Saviour was indeed despised. Despised and rejected and ill-treated. Hung on a cruel cross to take away our shame. Dying in my place. Lord, we thank you that as we come tonight, we can indeed say, 
that in your love and grace you took the punishment that was due to each one of us that know and love you, that have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that bond that binds the living church together, that the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price, that one day you will take us to be with you in glory. One day you will take us where that book is with our names written in, the Lamb's Book of Life. And how we thank you that across that book will be written paid in full, sin dealt with because of the one you love, your beloved Son, in whom you said you are well pleased. Lord, we thank you that we can be well pleased as well because of that love poured out, the price paid. Lord, we ask tonight that if there's any here in the building or listening online, that as yet know you not as Saviour, that, Lord, in your mercy, you would pour out your Spirit upon them, and bring them to that point where they turn in repentance and ask for forgiveness. Lord, help us. For your glory we ask. We pray tonight, Lord, for your church in the world. We think of places like Malawi where our dear brother Lapson labours for you to spread the gospel. We pray for him and his dear wife, Elaine, Ellen, that you would be with them. We think of the work there of the orphanage, the much bigger work that Lapson's involved in both there and in Malawi in Mozambique seeking to spread the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you would help him that many would come to know you as Saviour. We thank you for the work that he does in preaching the gospel, but we're also mindful that he does much to seek to help the poor and the needy. And no doubt as Easter is approaching, they'll be planning for their Easter conference, <coughs> at which many blind people will be attending we pray that that would be a time of great blessing, that you would pour out your Spirit upon the people there, that they would know the encouragement of God with them, of the Holy Spirit ministering to them. We pray that there'd be many that would come to saving faith. What we pray for Malawi, we pray for all the countries where your word will be faithfully preached this Easter time, we think of our sister Christine Jones and the work of OM as they seek to train people to go onto the streets to minister to the street children. Lord, our hearts go out to them as we think of boys and girls like those in our own Sunday school having to survive on the streets. We pray, Lord, that as they seek to bring relief and help, that you would bless them richly. We're mindful that in so many countries around our world, there are those who tonight, very young, who will be begging for the food to eat just to stay alive. Lord, our hearts cry out. We pray for our brothers and sisters in persecuted countries. Lord, we pray that you would help them as they seek to remain faithful to you that you would give them that strength that they need. We read so often of those being persecuted, being encouraged while they're under persecution because you give them the words to speak. We thank you for that. We pray for countries where there is persecution. And there are so many. Lord, in your mercy, you would save those who are in authority. We pray for leaders in countries like China, Iran, North Korea, and so many other countries where your people are being badly treated. Help us, Lord, to have the faith to believe that the gospel is big enough that the leaders in these countries can be wonderfully saved. 
that we can see a transformation. We pray for a modern day reformation in our world, that your word would be set free. We pray as well for nominal Christian countries like ourselves, that your word would go forth with power. That bishops who just do the job because it's a job would be wonderfully saved, have their eyes and their ears and their hearts open to you and would preach the gospel. Lord, what a miracle. Give us, Lord, the faith to believe because we do have a big God. Lord, we come nearer to home and we pray for our own people here. Many of your people are not well. We pray that you would minister to them, that they would know your help and encouragement, that they would soon be able to be up and about and feel stronger, and that you would indeed give them that encouragement. Some of your folk are being challenged by spiritual darkness, Lord, and we pray for them that you would minister to them, that you would put a hedge around them that as Satan attacks, they would know the protection of a holy God. We pray, Lord, for the week ahead, a busy week for the church, that we ask for your blessing upon the activities of this week. For our business meeting tomorrow night, we ask that you would go before. We pray for our time around your table on Friday as we remember our Saviour crucified. We pray that that would be special and that we would know your blessing as we meet together. Lord, in the quiet of this place, we would quietly come and pray for one another your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Our notices for the coming week, as I said in prayer, there are several things on. Tomorrow evening is the annual church meeting. Church members, please attend if you can. If you're not able to attend, then please see David and he will give you the link so we can join by teams. On Wednesday evening, we have our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m., and then on Thursday morning is the last toddler group before the Easter break. Please pray for those who are working there that God would give them great encouragement. Friday morning at 10.30, we meet around the Lord's table as we remember our Saviour dying on that cruel cross. And then Friday evening at 7.30 is the ladies' Bible study and a warm invitation is given to all ladies to join that meeting. And then on Saturday morning, an equally warm but more calorific invitation for the men to join for the men's breakfast and Bible study. But pray the Lord would bless us as we meet there. A couple of forward dates. Caring for Life coffee morning on the 13th of April. I did speak to John during the week and he's looking forward to being with us and looking forward to sharing. He said it's nice that in retirement he can still come and do a few bits for Caring for Life. He'd even been out on his bike to go and collect some leaflets to send to us, so I think that shows how keen he was. And then church weekend is not far away, the 18th and 19th of May. Before I hand over to Mark, let's rise and sing our second hymn, 603, Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride, Caring not, my Lord was crucified, Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary.
One small notice I forgot. There are several of these invitations on the table next door. If you can make use to invite neighbor or friend to our Easter services, please do make use of them. Thank you. Let's turn in God's Word to Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verses 13 to 37. We're looking tonight at the ignorance of Easter. Then Pilate, when he caught together the chief priests and rulers and the people, said to them, You brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed I have, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. For I sent him back to him, you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving death has been found in him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried at, out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, call, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him, I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him, and women also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. But if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood and looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Amen, the Lord. Help us to understand his word. We sing a hymn that fits very well with the sight that the people saw as Jesus was crucified. All you who pass by to Jesus draw nigh to you as at nothing, that Jesus should die, your ransom and peace, your surety is. Come see if there ever was sorrow like his. <coughs>
Turn to the Lord in prayer as we come to his word. Lord, we thank you that Jesus remains in our place. Lord, we cannot come without him before your presence. For you've appointed that your son should sit at your right hand to make intercession for us. He is the only one who is able to speak to you directly for us. Lord, he alone is worthy and has been appointed unto this role. And Lord, we see this role outworked upon his cross as we hear him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, may we understand these words tonight. Lord, as many around the cross didn't understand what they were doing. Lord, may we understand the necessity of these words, that they be prayed for us too, that we may be saved. For Lord, it is by your grace alone that we can be redeemed, and only through Christ alone. So we ask in his name. Amen. Easter ignorance. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As Jesus interceded for you, around the cross there were many confident people. I mean, they raised their voices pretty loud, didn't they, showing their confidence, and they were sure that their actions were right, or at least they justified their actions as being right. Looking upon them from his cross, Jesus saw within them the law and ignorance an ignorance in their actions as we read of Jesus' intercession for the ignorant. And many continue to be very confident about their relation to Christ and carry on with their lives without needing to pay attention to him, they feel, and as if the, the ignorance they have is justified and right. They may even join in the mockery of mocking us who appreciate the ignorance for which Jesus intercedes. As we look at these verses, we see within them the ignorance for which there was need of intercession, and then we will consider the intercession for ignorance of Jesus that comes to us even today. The ignorance of intercession is found in those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, in Luke 23, verse 34. Within these verses, there are three things for which Jesus interceded of which the people were ignorant of. He interceded regarding the offended, he interceded regarding the offender, and he interceded regarding the offering. The offended, Father, forgive them. As Jesus began his prayer, we know that he was addressing his Father in heaven. We cannot misunderstand that, but maybe you are not familiar with why we understand this to be the case. There are no mentions of the man Joseph who was considered to be his father, although he was not the natural father of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he was born of the Holy Spirit through Mary. Nevertheless, he was considered to be his father, for he was married to Mary. Being present, he was not present during the ministry of Jesus, and he does not appear anywhere in the scriptures after the birth of Jesus and the early years of Jesus' life at the point of Jesus' ministry and especially at the death of Jesus. There is no mention of him. The logical conclusion that comes from this is that Joseph himself has died and this would not be unexpected. Jesus is praying then to his father who on occasions during his ministry was heard speaking from heaven, addressing his son, saying with a sudden voice in Matthew 3, 17, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Still the sound of the voice from heaven appears to be unheeded. Relatively few up until this point actually believe that he is the son of God and have any relation to him. This phrase of father is not unique within the New Testament. It is found in the Old Testament. It is understood from the Old Testament. But it doesn't appear to have been much used in regard to him. We find it in 1 Chronicles 29.10. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. 
And Isaiah 63, 16 says, Doubtless you are our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from everlasting is your name. So the lack of use of it is not an excuse for them not knowing that God was their father. We find that Luke introduces his God within the introduction of his gospel. In chapter 3, verse 38, he gives a genealogy, that list of names. And he says at the conclusion of it that he was the son of, the son of Adam, son of God. Somewhere around the cross of Jesus would have thought of themselves as estranged and very distant in their relation to God, understanding their, understand, not understanding themselves to be... Uh, understanding their creation, sorry, but generations and geographic distance made them strangers to God as fathers, as their father. Meanwhile, among the Jews, they saw their relation to God as being through a physical connection, not with Adam and his creation, but rather with Abraham. They counted him to be their father through their genealogies and their circumcision, for instance. However, there's at least a few people near the cross do you know the relevance of this term, Father? His mother is there. She knows. And there are some women there who may also have known they followed Jesus in his ministry, including also a beloved disciple who stood amongst them. Yet even as Jesus prayed to his Father, many were ignorant of who they were offending. And they were fulfilling the words of Scripture as they did this. The psalmist says in Psalm 69, verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. The offender. As the taunts of the Jews and the thieves and the soldiers continued, the die was cast at his feet for the clothing he had once worn. He was heard to pray for the forgiveness of those around the cross as offenders. Forgive them. Revealing as they yet their consciences were ignorant of the offenses of their actions. The Jews considered his death to be expedient. John tells us in John eleven, forty nine to fifty, that one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest for that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. They thought that they were upholding God's word, and to them the offense was to let this man continue to live, this Jesus who had been amongst them. As for the others who were around the cross, there were soldiers there. They were carrying out their duty. This was what they were commanded to do. This is what they had done maybe many times before, given this assignment of crucifixion. They came to the place called Calvary, and they crucified him, along with the criminals. The order had been given to them. They were carrying out what they were told, and they taunted Jesus as they had taunted countless convicted men before him. Then there were the thieves, one on the right, the other on the left. They must have thought all their joys had come at once. There they were, criminals hanging on crosses, expecting to be tormented, but the focus was on the man on the middle cross, so they joined in with them. They focused on his being there to take the focus of their own lives. We read in Mark fifteen thirty two, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Even reminding us this is an unusual sight to see. And amazing given the fact that all three men are struggling for breath upon their crosses, for the purpose of the cross is not to bleed out, but rather to lack breath and that you might be suffocated under the weight of your own body. Yet they found the strength to ridicule the innocent man in the midst of them to detract attention from their own guilt. Although all were offenders and had offended his Father in heaven, still Jesus prays for them. He prayed for them as one of their number. Isaiah 53, verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he's poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for them. Jesus prayed for these people, though not as a multitude of voices, but as individuals. 
individuals whom God had raised his son on the cross to save. Jesus prayed for the thief who was beside him, who would say in a little while, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He prayed for the centurion below him who would look up and see him die and say, certainly this was a righteous man. He prayed for his mother. He prayed for the disciple John and the women interceding for them as he had done, interceded for these disciples before the mob in Gethsemane when he said, I have told you that I am he, therefore if you seek me, let these go their way. And saying this, he fulfilled be that this might be fulfilled, which he'd spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Jesus prayed for all whom the Father would call to himself. Some in this crowd would be amongst those on the day of Pentecost, maybe gathered in Jerusalem, who would feel the cutting of the sword of the Spirit within their hearts. And it may also include the word of God when it spread to the number of disciples who multiplied greatly in Acts 6, 7, and among them were the, some of the priests who were obedient to the faith. At this moment, they were all offenders, among the offenders, and he was numbered with them. Yet they were ignorant that they were guilty of offending their Father in heaven, which brings us to the offering. For they know not what they do. Their perspective on their actions was as witnesses of justice. None of them appeared to have seen what they were actually doing. The leaders of the people, they, uh, leaders and people, they stirred up to shout for his death and, and saw no connection between their actions and the view before them and the words of Scripture that they may have known. We read from Psalm 22, and it includes these words in verses 16 to 17. For the dogs have surrounded me, the congregation have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones, they look and stare at me. The cries of the Lord through Isaiah went unheard. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Instead, they continue to blaspheme Jesus. We find in the 35th verse of Luke 23, And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let them save himself, if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. Now hearing the familiar sounds of Psalm 22 again in verses 7 and 8, all those who ridicule me, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. The thieves joined in the chorus of blasphemy. Likewise, the priests also, Matthew says in Matthew 27, 41 to 44, mocking him with the scribes and elders, he saved others, he cannot save himself. If he is the king of the Jews, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe. He, ought, he trusted in God, he will deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. It was only an awakened thief who on the opposite side of Jesus would finally rebuke his fellow thief. And say to him in the 39th verse of Luke 23, and as he rebuked him, that he should say to him, do, not, do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. The soldiers admired their winnings, having shaken their dice. They divided his garments and cast lots for his clothing, they entered into the mockery of others and led by the Jewish rulers. The soldiers mocked him, coming and offering sour wine and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Even though Jesus drew attention to their ignorance, saying, they know not what they do, no one remembered what was said again in Psalm 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Ignorance provided no defense, though for the offenses of their actions and words. It was only through the intercession of Jesus on the cross that the Father could provide forgiveness, forgiveness 
for those who were ignorant of who they had offended, that they were offenders for whom God was making an offering for their sins, the prayer of Jesus would be answered when they understood for themselves what Isaiah had spoken in Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. There was the one then offended. There were the offenders. There was the offering. All of these are included in this intercession of Christ from his cross. Which brings us to the intercession of ignorance. And we go again to the offended. Father, forgive them. The grim sight of crucifixion seems to be very distant from heaven, doesn't it? And the joy that surrounds the throne of God those who stood at the cross felt at liberty to behave as they saw fit without any thought that they were offending God as their Father in heaven. This location seemed to have little relation to heaven and offending God. Many who live their lives in such ignorance consider the locations they are in and the actions they do to have little or no relation to God in a like manner, even though they are offending him. It's not the location that was the offense. It was the actions in relation to God. God is our Father. God made the first Adam, and we are all descended from him. He was formed of clay, bearing the image of God, which received life through God's breath. And you have received in like manner breath. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Although you may pretend, many pretend ignorance around the world, and people reject God as the one who made and formed them, Isaiah 29, 15 to 16, woe to those who seek to hide to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? Shall the thing made say of him who made it, he does not, did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Here, looking at the cross, we are shown that we offend our Father when we refuse to accept Jesus. His son shares anything, refuse to accept that his son, Jesus Christ, shares anything in common with us. The Bible is clear. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Psalm 69, 7 to 9, because for your sake, I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you has fallen on me. The offending of our Father is worsened further when we reject his own honoring of Jesus before us as his beloved son. This is witnessed of and testified of within the Gospels, three years' worth of signs and wonders that were performed in the presence of many witnesses, accompanied with the wisdom of his authoritative instruction. And then, as we have heard ourselves in recent messages, God has said many times, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Still people hear this and dismiss that they have offended their father. They say God is love. As they say that, they say, well, if, as if love knows no hurt or wounds. Yet love is the most costly and painful of all the mo emotions that we possess. It may be wounded by dishonor and disobedience and dismissiveness. As Jesus spoke himself in Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. 
The fact that God is love increases the gravity of our offending our Father. Take note of Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Remember, God did not pity the pre-flood world when it rejected him as father. And hearing Jesus pray upon the cross to the father reveals that we have offended the father, whether we come near or far from the cross. Hearing Jesus pray upon the cross to the father reveals this offense, for it is not our location that is our offense. It is our treatment of our relationship to our true father. And his son that offends him as our God. But then of the offender, forgive them. Not only has the father been offended, but he is offended by our actions. While some of the offenses of those around the cross are recorded within the pages of scripture, the real record of them is found before the father. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear, Isaiah 59, 2. What we read as Jesus, in Jesus' prayer, Father, forgive them, informs us of God's acquaintance with our offenses. The offense of our determination to destroy Jesus and his instruction. Many consider it to be expedient to remove Jesus with his cross while believing that they are honoring God not offending, by not offending a pagan society. They maintain their religion with lies. People can be good, even righteous, without the instruction or teaching of Christ. We can use washing, penance, sacrifice to please God and forbid, forbid the phrases of sin or repentance or conversion and redemption. Then there is the offense of taunts and temptations of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We live in an evil and adulterous generation that still says, well, give me a sign but refuses to believe all the signs that God has already given within his word. Remember Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit in Mark 8, 12. Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say, no sign shall be given to this generation. Then there are those who commit the offense of duty. Oh, well, I'm just carrying out the commands of others. The teaching and the applying of the rules of others who've said, I must do this and and passing off our actions as if someone else is responsible. I don't need to think about that. I don't need to concern myself. Somebody else has said it. And they all be tempted to find someone to blame. They blame parents, environment, culture, wealth, education, many things for our lack of belief. The offense of distraction. Pointing at other people and saying, well, I'm not as bad as them. Even thieves on the cross tried this, didn't they? The thieves were spared the abuse while they kept the focus on Jesus. Nobody pointed out that they were hung there for thievery and maybe murder. Even thieves can deny the guilt when they use distraction. You might be tempted to find someone else who's sitting near you or around you and say, well, I'm not like them. But the point still is made. The only one in all of this scene who did not use these tactics was the one right in the midst, the Son of God. His cross stood as a testament of our offenses from which we hear him pray, Father, forgive them. As in the cases of the thief next to him, the centurion below him, people in the crowd around him, Jesus' prayer is the intercession containing the forgiveness we all need for our offenses. How sad it is that while Jesus prays, we uh, those around him on the cross continue to add further offense by offending our Father to whom he prays. How thankful we should be that God our Father prioritizes the prayer of his Son over reacting against the offenses of our sin. What should the sight be that day? Surely his Son should not be there upon the cross. The earth should be burnt up with all the bodies of those who shouted and abused the Savior, but it's not the case. He raised him so that this prayer may be heard on behalf of those who offended and are at this point ignorant. 
the offering. Those who stood around Jesus saw him hanging on the instrument of execution as a condemned man without any way of escape. This sight gave voice to their blasphemous words and shout, if only they had listened to his words and remembered what he had said. He had said in John 3, 14, 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom, Matthew twenty twenty seven to 28. They might have remembered the words of John the Baptist, who introduced Jesus, saying in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. If they had read their scriptures, they would have discovered there within them that they speak of Jesus. You search the scriptures, said Jesus, for them that you find eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me, that you may have life. John 5, 39, 40. These are the voices that surrounded the events of the cross, but nobody listened. And today, the church has spent 2,000 years exploring the scriptures to find all the scripture points to, and directly and indirectly, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole of the Old Testament focuses upon him in one way or the other. The need of him, the des what God is going to provide, how it is going to be worked out and fulfilled. These tell us that mankind has offended their father with offenses beyond number, and the only remedy is one offering and sacrifice which men rejected and God has accepted. Isaiah 53, 7 to 12, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but at the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he was poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The only person who can stand between you and your, offense, and your offenses and your father whom you've offended is the one who's on the cross, who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know this? While Jesus was chastised for our sins and bruised for our iniquities, he remained silent. Even as the cross was raised in position, we do not read of anything by which he opened his mouth. Only when the from the cross he saw his father's children did he open his mouth and pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. At that moment, his blood spoke better things than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood called for justice. The blood of Christ calls for your forgiveness. As it falls from the offering and sacrifice of his body given for you, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was delivered up for your offenses. This is the offering. So has Jesus interceded for you? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We can have seen before Jesus a variety of people, each one of whom has personally offended the Father with the offenses they have done. But only the Father's true children know that he has prayed heard Jesus pray for their forgiveness. I don't know everyone I'm looking at, maybe tonight the camera's on, so who's laying behind it even, I would not know. But I do know this. To the best of my ability, I've tried to make sure that we are no longer able to say that we are ignorant. We know that we have offended our Father. We know that we have, by our own offenses, offended our father 
Nor are we ignorant any longer that there is an offering that God has provided one and only, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the answer to the question? Has Jesus interceded for you? That can only be a yes if you have felt Jesus looking at you as he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You cannot name and claim it here. It's he on the cross who must intercede for you. And he say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Well, you do well because Satan's the best believer in the world in Jesus. He's the best theologian on the matter. Is he saved? No. We must be sure that we have looked unto Christ alone and he has become our savior by his own will and purpose. You know this to be so. What a sight it must have been for whoever it was the eyes of Christ fell upon at that moment. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the moment of his resurrection, they would feel that relief, but also the remembrance and the awareness. Jesus Christ had been raised for my justification. The guilt and the burden that I felt for his death is past. I have been given unto new life. Have you heard him pray? Do you know the Father has answered? Has he brought forgiveness to you? You once didn't know what you were doing. You do now. Now you need this forgiveness that Jesus offers. He is willing to intercede. Are you willing that he intercede for you? Let's pray. Lord God, many have sat under the sound of your gospel, under your word, and thought to themselves what it applies to someone worse than me or someone in more need than me. Lord, as we look around the cross of Christ, we find it applies to all of us. You're the one who formed Adam. You're the one who formed us within our mother's wombs. You knit us together. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The very breath in our being belongs to you. Without that breath, we would not exist in this world this night. And Lord, when you call for it, that breath will leave this body and return unto him who gave it. You are our Father. We have offended you from the moment we were born, and we will do so without grace until the moment we die. Because, Lord, we are sinful people, shaped in sin, born in iniquity. We are offended. And yet, Lord, you chose to set before us the Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, in whom there was no sin, nor was there any offense found in him. But he willingly laid down his life that he might die in our place. We thank you for his silence as he endured the chastisement of our sin and bore our iniquities. But we thank you even more for the words of his prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was once true of us, Lord. We did not know what we had done. We knew not our Father, we knew not of our deeds and their consequences, but we do now. And yet here is the grace that before ever we were born into this world, God had already laid our sins on him. Help us to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The Lord, to take no credit of anything good in our lives, but to place ourselves entirely into his salvation and work. To seek the gaze of his love upon us, that his eyes may indeed give us the Holy Spirit to assure us that God truly is our Father. The Lord, we may know we are the forgiven children of God. Lord, this is the greatest miracle that can be accomplished in this world it is the greatest wonder that is ever achieved that a man or woman may be born again by the grace of God. So may we know it to be the case for each one of us this night. Open our eyes that we may see wonderful grace that you have for us. And Lord, may we feel the Spirit within our heart assure us that we are the children of God. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, it's lovely to be able to sing a hymn at the end of this, uh, including this, reminding ourselves that before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven in his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. <laughs> that are hidden in Christ. If you should treat us as our sins deserves, our life would be far more miserable than anything experienced in this world today. But Lord, thank you for the grace that not only pitied us while we were yet sinners, but saved us. And Lord, gives unto us day by day what we don't deserve, Lord, what comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and your mercy towards us. So, Lord, may your mercies be new every day of this week. May we thank you for them at every moment that we have opportunity. And may we give you praise and glory for them as we live out our lives before a world with whom many are still ignorant that they too have offended their father. There are offenses in their lives for which they need forgiveness. And there is an offering and a sacrifice that God has provided. We trust for many of them too, as we pray for family, for friends, for those around us, that they may yet see the sight of Jesus that we have seen. Thank you, Lord, for these truths, for this hope that is before us this week. We ask, Lord, your blessing on us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>